Hey guys, um, live with this update. A little bit pissed because you can't see the Lula Libre shirt in the shot. I think I gotta make this a little bit more professional at some point. At least get a stand for the phone. Um, obviously full live show tomorrow night. You see the Lula shirt? Lula Libre. Very big deal to me, of course. Uh, Lula Livre and the Lula shirt. <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking about that more uh, tomorrow um, on the full show, of course. Somya Shankar talking about the Indian elections, and uh, Felix Biederman and I talking about the drama on The View. Fucking Meghan McCain disrespecting Joy. And a lot. Yeah, man, Lula really is a significant, significant figure. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about this book uh, that I'm working on for Zero Books. And I don't have a publication date yet, but it's getting closer. Um, it's a book about the intellectual dark web. And, you know, of course... I'll be making fun of these people. Um, Lula is beautiful, without a doubt. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be, you know, making fun of these people. There'll be some Dave Rubin going on. There's going to be some, you know, uh, my version of thought experiments, uh, you know, stuff like that. But what I'm trying to do is actually situate it in a couple of ways that I think are really, really important for a kind of longer term project. And what I want to talk about just briefly today, and I'll do more of these, are just a couple of kind of basic points about it. One, even if the intellectual dark web goes away, right? Like even if this particular brand configuration kind of splits off and, you know, there's a new word for it and the IDW sort of like, goes the way of the new atheists. Um, the basic, uh, I like Peter Coffin, the basic structure of these arguments that they're putting forward are going to be the sort of template for center-right argumentation for our political lives, right? So if I'm saying that, say there's people who are overt white nationalists and fascists, and of course, the IDW has all sorts of connections to them, but they don't frame themselves in the right way, in the same way. Uh, they're making a different type of appeal. Then there's just the oligarchs, you know, the money bags. And then there's, uh, you know, religious conservatives. The IDW is still going to be, um, as I say, the sort of template for people who want to either pretend that they're in the center, quote unquote, uh, or make arguments for far-right policies or for naturalizing uh, markets or for, you know, various other uh, right-wing politics, but in a way that they think is still mainstream or quote-unquote moderate, right? So the conversations that come out of the IDW, even if it isn't called the IDW, even if it is rebranded, but the types of arguments put forward by people like Harris are going to be the template. They're going to be um, how we deal with the right, center right, as I'll say for tonight moving forward. So that's why they matter, uh, unfortunately, even beyond themselves in this one sort of cultural moment of like the Barry Weiss profile and Quillette and the sort of energy around the IDW. These basic appeals, these basic arguments, these basic uh uh, culture war controversies, these attempts to naturalize markets, these attempts to explain away structural problems like inequality with appeals to, to quote unquote science. This is going to be the template uh, that you will hear those arguments coming from, right? So that's why answering them is important beyond them because they're going to be uh, basically beyond that um, you know, they're going to exist beyond. I, I can't help but notice the God sad comment. And 
as appealing as a comedic target he is, I just can't reward him. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's, he's definitely not going to make the book because it's just sad. <laughs> so the thing that happens then in the book is that's the kind of basic framework of why these people matter um, beyond, uh, you know, just this sort of particular brand in particular moment. It's a certain kind of politics uh, that is going to be set in motion and in place moving forward. And the big feature that they, these people share in the IDW and all of the right wing shares is that they are fundamentally anti-historical. And they're anti-historical in three ways. And I'll talk about this more in upcoming videos and always in the book and all obviously in the book. But let's take the big three. Harris, Peterson, Shapiro. Harris, in some ways, is the most overt in the sense that he is relentlessly, he's not just ahistorical, he's anti-historical. He actually said in his debate with Ezra Klein, where he was profoundly aggrieved in his, you know, full-fledged defense of the bell curve. And Ezra Klein, you know, very moderate, very centrist interlocutor, was trying to historicize a bit. Like, hey, there's a bit of a history of, you know, as an example, European men uh, coming up with quote-unquote scientific metrics to naturalize the inferiority of other races. There's a history of this. And Sam Harris literally says something to the effect of history doesn't matter. The history is irrelevant, he said in that sort of Harris whiny way when he gets triggered. And when you go across all of his sort of work, particularly when he's trying to intervene in really important things, Islam, the Middle East, race, IQ, his appeals go in between sort of a very, very basic uh, rendition or representation of things like poll numbers, uh, which might be snapshots of a certain attitude in a moment, or, you know, these thought experiments. He never confronts and deals with the history. And actually the point that I'm going to be making more broadly is it isn't just that he's missing that, it's that in the same way that he demands to be read, without any context or analysis and any sort of contextualization of his work as being unfair or taking him out of context. That's how he wants us to look at the world. So that's one lane. Then there is, uh, you know, uh, Peterson, right? And that's pretty clear. That's the, the left historic, the, the right, uh, sorry about that. The, the left historicizes, the right mythologizes. So the real sugar uh, there is that, you know, Peterson's trying to do a project where he's mashing up basically um, Jungian psychology with evolutionary biology as a way to explain away the problems of things like inequality, right? All of a sudden, we don't need to figure out inequality um, if we can explain why inequality is natural state using whether it's a, you know, a fairy tale or a, or a misuse of, of science. And it, obviously there'll be a lot more in the book on this, but I'm just giving you the basic outline. And then Shapiro actually does represent history, but it's a totally propagandized version of it. And it's West is best stuff. It's, it's, it's a pure sort of propagandistic project. And it's the most historical quote unquote, but it's pure propaganda. It's, it's, it's AM talk radio right wing stuff. Now, the answer that I'm trying to chronicle here, though, is two parts. So one part is, is that uh, the IDW has no answer for material problems. Uh, you know, you're either off in some type of a historical cloud world with Harris, or if you're Peterson, maybe it might have some good self help advice, but ultimately, He's trying to naturalize and valorize a world which doesn't work for most people. It actually doesn't even work for his own sort of preoccupations about the uprooting of community. 
Uh, and then, you know, Shapiro again, and, and that sort of tells the whole story there because, I mean, he really is just a sort of standard right-wing talking head. Uh, so part of the answer is this, the socialist, the materialist piece, right? What does all this stuff have to do with the material realities of people's daily lives? This has nothing to do uh, if you're sitting and consuming this stuff all day and getting worked up about all of these various controversies and boogeymen on the college campuses, this isn't going to help you, as an example, discharge your student debt. This isn't going to help you, uh, you know, get health care. Or even if you're actually relatively more successful, chart a sustainable path for you and your community in a time of truly unprecedented uh, capitalism, and stability and technology, right? So one part of the answer always has to be this socialist materialist piece. And this is one element of it. This is the, you know, this is the, this, the core stuff. This is Marx, this is Adolf Reed. But I also think it isn't enough to skip out on the fact that they are exploiting these cultural controversies right now and they are playing to prejudices, right? In various ways, not as overtly as people in the alt-right, but in that, you know, they're swimming in similar ecosystems. And then that brings us to another challenge because just as sometimes the materialist analysis that I'm a part of can miss the essential work of example, you know, as an example, dealing with race and racism, uh, a lot of, you know, conventional, uh, quote unquote, identity politics is just sort of moralism that responds to, uh, you know, uh, people like the dark web correctly, you know, calls them out on their various bigotries and almost always they're right. Uh, but it doesn't usually offer a sort of strong, durable counter argument. And I also think ultimately there are weak points in that area which the IDW exploits, right? It exploits the excesses of controversy culture, it exploits the moralism, it exploits some of the sort of, you know, the toxic and silly traits of the online left. So what I'm interested in though, is, and this is, you know, coming from my own experience and the people that I've been really influenced by in my project, whether we're talking, you know, I talked about Marx and Adolf Reed, but also, you know, Fatima Mernisi, or uh, Bill Fletcher Jr., or Amartya Sen, or Kwame Anthony Appiah, uh, but also art, also sport, also culture, right? Which is actually the notion that we really do live in a global world. These distinctions like East and West are truly fictitious. That's not like a nice politically correct statement. That's the reality. That is the truth of our lives. And I'll just leave you with this example that I'm using in my book, which I'm very excited about. Amartya Sen, uh, who was a brilliant uh, philosopher and economist, uh, brilliant philosopher and economist. He wrote Development is Freedom, which is a good book, definitely worth reading. He wrote in the 1990s about the Asian values debate. And this was a big thing in the 1990s because these heads of state in Singapore and Malaysia who were definitely opposing, uh, excuse me, Sen, yes, Sen, Sen is still alive, my mistake. They were opposing human rights things like freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and they, and they promoted some very authoritarian, that would be Lula Brooks. Bro, uh, Lula would be the only person that I would be a uh, vice president for, nobody else. But they were opposing um, civic rights. And they were appealing to, they said, look, we do Confucian values, right? We don't, um, we don't accept Western standards of human rights. We have our own standards of human rights, which include, by the way, significant violations of human rights, right? So there was one pole of that. And in some ways you could slot those kind of arguments into sort of pure identity arguments in a way because it's suggesting there isn't a sort of global project, right? Then there's the Western chauvinist position, which is that, hey, there is global human rights and we created them in the West and you absorbed them in the East. Also just total bullshit. There's no uninterrupted chain from, uh, there is no uninterrupted chain from 
the uh, Greeks to the Enlightenment. There's also this whole age where we know that Islam held and sort of translated Greek culture. Uh, and, and the same thing, obviously, in the East. There's, no, there's these, not these like uninterrupted civilizational chains. So what Sen said was like, look, there is, there are global human rights standards. There are a global desire that all human beings seem to share to have a freedom from want and to have an ability to express themselves and hold power accountable. That is global. And then, on the, but where the Western chauvinists are wrong is that you can find in every single tradition, East and West, the roots of arguments for that accountability to power. And he documented it in India, in China, uh, in Africa, in Islamic civilizations. You can read each tradition you want in a way that would um, lead to a promotion of an expansion of human well-being and rights. Just as, of course, you can read the Western tradition to limit it. So what I want to do here in some ways is synthesize to the IDW a real uh, materialist, historicized answer, and then actually as part of an answer to uh, their bigotries, and I would say Western chauvinism is actually a global uh, stance uh, in response where we're, we're genuinely trying to build out a global culture that shares goals, that shares vision, uh, and uh, can build out together. And that's, you know, that's a big part of my show, right? That's why I think it is important that people understand people like Cabral um, as much as, uh, you know, uh, Eugene Debs. And by the way, you should be engaging with and understanding both. And, you know, Fatsa Marmanisi and Emma Goldman uh, and a whole variety of other influences. But this is also not necessarily even political and intellectual. Every great piece of pop culture or athletics or even, you know, technology is part of these sort of global systems. So, you know, the other answer to these people sort of narrowing our bandwidth and sort of trying to put limits on global culture is that the best of our culture today is fundamentally global and fundamentally interactive like that. And so this is what I'm doing in the book. And uh, thank you. I'm honored by that. Definitely keep up on Haiti. That's what I'm doing in the book. And uh, I appreciate all of you. Of course, Lula Livre. Lula Livre. Uh, and I think the book will come out in the uh, late spring or fall. All right, everybody. Lula Livre, peace and love. See you tomorrow with Samya Shankar and Felix Biederman. Spread the word if you haven't yet. It's time to become a patron, patreon.com slash TMBS. Let's keep these counts going up on YouTube and let's make all of it happen. I really appreciate all of you. All right, get that in. What's the last question? Quick, you're amazing. Quick, you said you had a last question. You said you had a last question. Yeah, you didn't get it in. All right, guys, peace and love. Appreciate you all. Thank you.